Okay, so uh, I'm going to thank you, Keith, and everyone else. And is it all listening? In? I'm going to go over to our friends, the music man. I'll be able to see what I'm such a laugh then. There he is. It's Derek Sheldon. And Derek, you know, he's written a book called Liverpool Unravels. You know, this is all the music and everything else. He's done everything. That's Did you your title? Liverpool Unravels? Yeah, that's a nice strange. Yeah. What that well, I'll be like that. It, it's Rock and Roll Unravelled. Rock and roll on that. <laughs> Same sort of principle, though. Yes, of course. Ball about Liverpool. Exactly. Anyway, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Good to see you again, and Gerard. Yeah, I'm sorry that I uh, left you uh, waiting there because. That's all right. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, um, the Elvis film I haven't seen, as I'm being honest. Uh, I'll tell you. You know, you can tell me all about it and whatever. Uh, but tell me if I'm right or wrong here. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. I reckon that that Colonel fella ruined Elvis. Now, I'll tell you for why. He came out, he was doing all his jigging and everything else, Jay Louch Rock or whatever. And uh, he, he was a phenomenal or a phenomena at the time, you know, the, the, the 50s, because who you had then, you had the likes of Tony Bennett. Uh, Frank Sinatra, you know, all the crooners, all the great crooners. Then all of a sudden, this young fella comes on uh, the scene and bang, you know, he's away. People loved him. And I know that the Americans, uh, ordinary Americans, called it the devil's music. I'm talking about dads, if you like. And, yeah, exactly. You know, the, the daughters and, uh, and saying, where are you going? I'm going to see Elvis or whatever, or what are you playing? This is Elvis. It's the devil's music. Well, I do know that. Dick Colonel Parker, his manager, ruined him after that. Uh, a lot of people have that view. Me, I have completely the opposite view. I think the, the reason now Elvis is, you know, the legend that he is, and I think there's only one other artist group you could put in the same category, and that's the Beatles. I think they stand absolutely alone for totally different reasons. And I think the th whole thing about the, the Colonel is everybody decries the, uh, the 1960s movies. But I think if you look at the time, it's a whole different story. I mean, Elvis had a phenomenal rise to fame in the 50s. But actually, it, it's his first manager, well, his first manager technically was Scotty Moore, the guitarist. But shortly after, a guy called Bob Neal managed Elvis. He was a local Memphis um, record shop owner, DJ, and uh, promoter. And he was with Elvis, uh, well, effectively, for about 18 months. When Elvis signed to RCA, it was, it was, the, it was Bob Neal that introduced the Colonel. Was this, this when he first came on the scene that you're talking about? Well, I mean, he, he did his first... Um, a, a talent show when he was about 10 years old but yeah we're talking about the mid 50s we're talking about the okay. sun years 54 okay. to 56 basically or 55 54 55 uh, yeah. basically and it was the colonel that signed uh, after about three months after the colonel really got involved in elvis's management it was the colonel that signed him to rca and then elvis had a phenomenal rise to fame in 1956 i mean he's in the march of 56 he had his first national hit with uh, Jailhouse Rock, and in the December of '56, he had ten singles on the uh, Billboard Hot 100, um, and then basically he just built on that across the '50s. <clears throat> uh, but then he went in the army, and I think this is where the Colonel really um, came into his own. I mean, Elvis was away for two years, but he still managed to keep the Colonel still managed to keep Elvis in the in the public eye. I mean, he had ten hit singles across that period, and I think the critical point is that when Elvis came out of the army in the March of 56, uh, uh, the March of 60, the music scene had changed absolutely completely. You know, the golden age of rock and roll was well and truly dead after Buddy Holly um, died. And what you've got, somebody mentioned the Beach Boys earlier. What happened in America, completely different in the UK, but what happened in America was you had a whole bunch of new genres um, spring up. You had dance crazes, the twist and the like, Popeye with... Um, Chubby Checker, you had um, surf music, 
um, with uh, people like the Beach Boys, Jan and Dean, and one or two others slightly earlier. Yeah, can I get you? I'm sorry about that, but when you mentioned Jan and Dean, they they came out before the Beach Boys. Oh, and yeah. Do they, you they, they, that they copied them? To, or what? Yeah, because, they, they had about five hit records before they had the, yeah. before they were a surf band. Yeah, and um, it was actually the Beach Boys that gave them uh, their first uh, Surf City. I think it was. Uh, wrote their for their first hit and they had a number one with it uh, okay. and in fact the beach boys dad who uh, managed the band wasn't very happy that they'd given a song away that they'd written what brian had written um and somebody else had had a, a big hit with it but what the colonel did he actually moved elvis from being in direct competition with the likes of bob dylan the stones the beatles and in about 62 uh, Elvis did his last uh, concert, his last new al uh, album of uh, rock and roll stuff. And after that, the Colonel had this strategy that um, only uh, singles and albums would be released from the movie soundtracks and that Elvis wouldn't make any personal appearances. So, I mean, the, the Colonel famously called himself a snowman. He could create something out of nothing. And what he created for Elvis, he didn't create Elvis. What he created was the environment that Elvis could survive the 60s in. Um, because what was happening is that the, the whole music uh, world was changing. All of the, virtually all of the 50s uh, artists uh, stopped having records around, stopped having hits around 64 because you had the British invasion. Uh, it was when the Beatles went on um, uh, Ed Sullivan. And uh, <clears throat> then after that, you know, a whole uh, flux of, uh, of bands, British bands went over. The first wave were nearly all Liverpool bands, Mersey beat bands, and American bands couldn't get a look in. They even changed their names to sound like British bands. I mean, there was a band called Jet Set who changed their name to the Beef Eaters. Can't get much more British than that, is it? Well, no, no. <laughs> they did nothing until they changed their name again to the Birds in the. Uh, oh, wow. the birds, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because what happened again in 65, 66, that's when rock music came. That was when people like The Doors, um, Jimi Hendrix particularly, um, and all that new heavy blues uh, music came out. So if Elvis had been trying to compete, I don't really see, personally, I mean, he would always be famous. After the 50s, he was always going to be big. You mentioned Sinatra. And I think that uh, without the Colonel, without the 60s strategy of protecting him from having to compete with, um, firstly, the... Uh, different music scene when he came uh, out of the army then the british invasion which which did for most of his uh, contemporaries and then rock music again he would have had to have keep uh, uh, reinvented himself and unlike the beatles a lot of the beatles fame is down to the, the the sort of writing side of it i wouldn't say elvis is just a singer i um, basically that's what he was he didn't write anything i mean he got credited on a lot of singles simply because the colonel uh, made money for him but then what happened um, across the 60s, he made 31 movies as an actor. The last one was in 69. Uh, it was called um, Change of Habits, where he f fell in love with a nun. Interesting kind of... Uh, you say, yeah. <laughs> as you would, exactly. Um, and that was when he, he went back on the road. He famously did his TV um, special, um, and he started recording stuff Again, was, was that series special? Time. Excuse me again, Derek. Mm. Was that series special where he was just dressed in all black leather and it was like around his stage? Yeah, that was, and it. was just singing the songs. Yeah, that's right. There was a, uh, a, a small stage, it was the first time yeah. he'd been in front of an audience for about seven years. I mean, there were well, sort of studio bits as well. Well, uh, can that, I that say, the well, can I say something because. You know, his films were dire, in my opinion. They were dire. And uh, when I seen him, when I seen him on that stage in all this, you know, black leather, it was fantastic. Yeah. You know, that's Elvis. That's who, who we recognise Elvis as. And then all of a sudden, then he disappeared for a while. And then it was the Las Vegas show where he was, you know, came on dressed in that, like that mad suit, that white suit with fringes and, yeah. you know, and a cloak and all this. And I thought, well, 
what's he doing? You know, why is he doing this? And yeah, that that's one of my favourite things because he was fantastic live. Got to... Oh, he was. I mean, those those velvet, those um, Las Vegas concerts were absolutely awesome. He started in those zoot, they're not zoot suits, um, uh, capes and the like. Go on, carry um, on. In in the um, very late sixties, very early seventies. So that was very much his his trademark across the the seventies. But I think what was what was good is when he when he came out of the 60s um he was still you know well thought of as the king of rock and roll because he'd been in a parallel universe across the 1960s he hadn't been trying to compete with well it, as well towards the end of the 1960s um you had uh, psychedelia well not even the end i mean psychedelia came out in around 67 66 uh, heavy metal came out in 67 i mean elvis would have had a lot to compete with but by the time he got to El to uh, Las Vegas in 1969, um, he'd got 15 years of hit records because he, he was having um, hit records right across the 1960s. I mean, his, his movies were feel good, basically, boy meets girl. You know, they, they weren't um, war and peace. You know, they weren't crime and punishment. Um, but they all did well at the box office. They all made um, money. And yeah. what it did, it kept the um, the singles flying. And what was what was really smart about the strategy, I think, is to see Elvis, you had to go to the movies. To hear Elvis, you had to buy records which were from the movies. So basically, the the movies generated the songs, and the hit singles sustained the movies. What he created was perpetual motion, basically. And yeah. again. Yeah, and there was nobody competing with him. He wasn't competing with the Beatles. And what's even more interesting, I think, is what it, it, it enabled him to do. He actually grew his fan base. Because if you look at, I mean, you, you look at the 50s uh, concerts he did, you know, they were all screaming teenagers. No two ways about that. As Frank was saying earlier, you know, the older generation thought it was the, the work of the devil. And the, there's a famous quote, I can't remember it exactly, but it was about a Bill Haley concert in uh, Germany and um, some uh, German uh, chancellor or um, treasurer, whatever, uh, actually said that, you know, it, it was the, the sort of basis of nuclear war. I can't remember the exact quote, but it's, uh, it's quite fun. But when you get to the late 60s, early 70s, when he started those Vegas residencies, if you look at those audiences, they cross generation. You know, you yeah. got three generations of people there. So what yeah. they did, that strategy of the 60s, I mean, yeah, they weren't particularly good films. They all made money, though. Um, what it did, it sustained him across the most turbulent time in rock and roll history. And when he emerged from that, he was still the undisputed king of rock and roll. He had 15 years of hit records. And the guy is a phenomenal showman. As you were saying, you know, on stage, absolutely awesome. Yeah, he was unbelievable, wasn't he? Yeah. And the, the thing is... And he admitted it himself. He used to make fun of himself, didn't he? Absolutely. And that's why I liked Elvis, because as I mentioned about that stage when he was all, you know, dressed in dressed in uh, black leather, yeah. he was doing all those funny things with his lip and he was laughing. Yeah. You know, the girls, were, you know, they were all laughing along, you know, whatever. Absolutely. And he, was just, he was just poking fun at himself. Yeah, absolutely. No, no but... When he was in uh, Vegas, you know, absolutely amazing. It, it, it was absolutely amazing. And the yeah. band was absolutely brilliant that, as that well. That was a great oh, concert. When he had them white fringes on. Yeah. That was yeah. a great concert. Uh, it, it was unbelievable. And he was going around to the audience, was it? Well, you know, just bending down on the stage. Yeah. And, you know, shaking their hands and kissing their hands and giving them yeah. scarves. You know, scarves you know, yeah, just giving them. And yeah. you can imagine those people. And as you mentioned, it's only because you mentioned that he was a showman. Absolutely. He was a showman. And he was a showman. Yeah. And he did he did look at me. He did look after his uh, friends. Well, his yeah. friends, I'm sorry. His audiences. Yeah. Because he valued his audiences, not just to go along and see him, yeah. but he just valued them. One of the great stories... Um, I heard about it. Maybe you can. Uh, he was he was only on his own, 
and he was driving and he seen this hitchhiker I don't know where he was in some I don't know where he was I haven't, I haven't a clue could have been in uh, the desert you know yeah. in Las Vegas or Stoke or Stoke where Stephen Snape lived <laughs> oh no he doesn't live there now he lives in Speak yeah going to see the wildebeest and speak anyway <laughs> uh, you know driving along and this, he picks this hitchhiker up he picks him up and he where are you going and, and he drops him off yeah and he goes like that he pull. He, he's got this very very valuable ring and he gives it to him. yeah so there he was just a hitchhiker so there you see and also he gets out and he calls him back hmm. and he gives him his car yeah and he goes into this like i don't know this other building whatever it was where he stopped outside goes in there hmm. and the fella was absolutely overwhelmed but it had to go through registration and everything later on yeah it's you know it's that screen can you clarify that because i heard that on a, a on a on a, um, a, a documentary about uh, yeah, um, it's, it's almost certainly true because famously um he used to give uh it well buy um cadillacs there's a there's a cadillac dealership in memphis yeah. and uh he used to actually if, if somebody was there looking at them you know now and again he, he would just give a buy a Cadillac for, buy you know, for the, a random the, guy that he, he just didn't know. I mean, so that story is almost certainly uh, true in essence. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I was watching this particular thing and it was about Howard Hughes. Yeah. And Howard Hughes was the very same. Hmm. He was giving things away as well. Yeah. And it was very similar when he, he picked up this particular fella. Or what? I'm not quite too sure. And he brought them home, and he said, "Yeah, I live here." Hmm. And he was looking at it, and I was a bit run down, you know, one of those like rickety little things with a porch yeah. on. And he said, "Why don't you put a fence around?" And he said, I "Can't afford a fence. Can't even afford to paint the outside." Anyway, he has everything done inside and out, and a beautiful picket fence. That's what I was used to. It. And also, uh, you know, he gave him, he sent him a truck. <clears throat> you know, they're like trucks, don't they, over yeah. there? And he sent him a brand new truck as a present. Brilliant. That was yeah. our duty yeah. to a person he didn't know. And yeah. that was the parallel to what yeah. Elvis did. Yeah, Elvis was famous for doing that. Um, he had, he had, he's, there's no doubt he had this generous uh, streak. I think he was, you know, by and large, I think he was a, a pretty nice guy, uh, really. Uh, and it, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, he made uh, three TV specials. There was that one, the, the comeback one in 60, 69 uh, or late 68. Um, and then he did the um, Aloha from Hawaii to one of the biggest audiences ever um, filmed, transmitted to. And then about two weeks before he died, because nobody knew this was going to be his last tour, he did a very short tour of America, uh, half a dozen states, only about six or eight concerts. Um, and um, he died two weeks later. And it, it's never been officially released that, but it's very easy to find sort of copies of the um, of, the, of the concert, about an hour or so. Um, so it was filmed, yeah. It was absolutely. And, yeah. I mean, this is the time now, you know, he's not looking as good as he used to. He was put on a bit of weight. Um, and uh, what was fascinating to watch about it was his stage presence. He was still there. He was still yeah. laughing at himself, and his voice was absolutely uh, top on. And the thing is, he was still doing all the audience um, interaction, and the audience absolutely loved him. No two ways about that. All this about Elvis being well over the top at the end, I, I don't buy that at all. No, well, he was only 42, wasn't he? So yeah. obviously he, he still had his voice. And I always remember when he died, and it just came on the news, you know, Elvis start, died. And then he started interviewing, like, famous people. And the most famous quote I, I, I always remember from these, you know, mega stars was from John Lennon himself. Yeah. And he says, you know, 
Elvis, you know, died, and what do you think of that? And he said, Elvis didn't die the other night. He died when he joined the army. That's exactly what Lennon said. He yeah. died when he joined the army. Yeah, I think, yeah, I, I'm not altogether sure. I, John Lennon also said that before Elvis, there was nothing. Oh, yeah, I know he said that, but this, this is like yeah. Uh, yeah. soon after he died, you know, and he caught up with Lennon. Yeah. Yeah. And don't forget, Lennon was anti-war, anti-everything, give oh, peace a chance. Yeah. And he yeah. said, you know, Elvis died when he went into uh, the yeah. I think yeah. he was making a point rather yeah. than uh, anything yeah. else. A lot of people think that, that basically the only good music he made was in the 50s. Um, I, I don't, I, I, I think some of the stuff, stuff he did in the 70s was uh, amazing. And some of the stuff, he did some covers. Uh, he did a uh, cover of Bob Dylan's Tomorrow's uh, A Long Time. And it was brilliant. I mean, the Guinness Book of Records has him listed as the best-selling solo artist of all time. See, this is one of the reasons I think that the Colonel is very much um, underestimated. And the movie, I, I saw the movie. It, as a movie, it's great. As a story about a very, very bad, bad man, a very, very um, good, good man, as it were, it, it, it was great. Uh, in, in terms of being a documentary, in terms of being anything to do with uh, really the Elvis and the Colonel story, you know, there were, there were a lot of... Um, well, it, let's just say it was very one-sided. I mean, great film. It's well worth uh, going to see. The other thing that the uh, the Colonel did was those Elvis concerts in Las Vegas. He revolutionized uh, the um, the cabaret circuit there. Basically, the hotels used to put on the cabarets with Sinatra and the likes uh, as loss leaders just to get people to the tables. And it was the Elvis concerts that became the model uh for the las vegas world and he also invented um merchandising uh t-shirts and but just about everything associated with uh making money on the side out of an artist he even made money out of people that didn't like elvis he created this this badge this pin with i hate elvis on so he, he made money out of people he actually who created like that yeah and the other he thing actually... the colonel did he negotiated very very high uh, payments for for you know Elvis to uh, perform both the records and the movie deals, and he constantly uh, renegotiated better deals, better and better deals with the movie companies and the um, and RCA. So you know, I think that I, I think there's a lot to be said for um, the fact that Elvis would al always have been famous after the sixties. You know, let, let's say that he he got as big as he did in the sixties when he went in the army. He would always have been famous. It might well have been, though, if he had never met the Colonel. When he was with um, his first real manager, Bob Neal, he cut five singles at Sun Records. That's ten sides. And singles four and five, uh, both sides of them, uh, made the country charts in America. His last single on Sun uh, actually was at number one for about five weeks on the country charts. So if he hadn't met the Colonel, um, he might never have got into uh, the sort of rock and roll direction. He might well have been a very big, successful country artist, someone like Johnny Cash, who would probably have... Um, what about... Uh, he, he, he liked gospel singing, didn't he? Was he a, was he a religious sort of person? Oh, he, he, had, a very, stuff, yeah, he had a very religious upbringing. Uh, you know, he went to um, chapel every... Uh, well, gospel um, church um, in East Tobelo. Um, every every Sunday. In fact, an interesting story on that side. Just around exactly the time, the sort of July of fifty four, when he joined um, Sun Records, cutting his first single, he actually auditioned uh, for a gospel group called the Song Fellows, who were a spin-off of the Blackwood Brothers, who were a very very big uh, gospel group at the time. And he failed the audition. They didn't think that he could um, harmonise. They thought he was a great lead singer, but they weren't impressed with his harmonies. So he failed that audition. So then he carried on with the rock and roll uh, at Sun. And then about three or four months later, that there was a plane crash and uh, some, a couple of the singers were killed. So they came back to Elvis and re-invited him to, uh, to join. But Elvis was now off on the road of uh, becoming the king of rock and roll. So he declined. 
So in another parallel universe somewhere, there could well be um, Elvis, who was simply a, 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 you know, a great gospel singer. So, it's you know, interesting. Me and Aunt uh, you know, we failed to, uh, we, we wanted to play, you know, we were, we were a tribute band to the Etherly Brothers. Really? And we failed. <laughs> We, we oh, called yeah, Bill and Ron. We called Bill and Ron. <laughs> <laughs> just run out. Just run out of these out of your comments, please, uh, if you yeah. don't mind, Kenny. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, just, oh, brilliant! I love yeah. the evidence. Uh, everyone's been asking you questions. Sorry. Everyone's been asking questions. Yeah. Uh, Linton Ellis, have you seen the latest Elvis move? Derek, have you seen the latest Elvis move? Yeah. Steven's yeah. Tom Hanks, yeah, yeah, I saw that. I mean, the acting's incredible. Well, let him these out there. I'm sorry, Derek. Let him these what... out uh, the comments. Uh, Ken, oh, football, Kenny Smith football. Top class, Sappy Frank at Anfield. It reminds me of being a kid playing three and eight. We'll just sell after the show. Okay, after we'll the... talk about that after the music section. Linda Ellis, Derek, have you seen the latest? Oh, Stephen Snape. Uh, to see all the world we've got to do is to return to County Road, go to Goodison, feed and tap. That's all you do this, you know. Mark Kennis. Derek, did you notice Elvis Presley's voice sounded different, as in higher, when he was young in the 50s, but seemed to go deeper as he got older? Is that normal for voice to change as you get older? Yeah, I think that's a fair comment, yeah. Uh, he had a very rich voice. I mean, Elvis is not, I will not say, goes far, say unique, but I mean, a very, very rich voice. Yeah, and he, and he also goes on to, to say, uh, I found out when the Beatles met Elvis, the story goes, he wasn't that keen on John Lennon. Is that true? Well, I know that they, they did meet once at um, Elvis's apartment, and uh, Elvis uh, jammed with, uh, uh, well, with them, but mostly with Paul McCartney. I don't know if he didn't like John Lennon, but reading about it, um, they, they it, it seemed to be... Um, a, a meeting of um, people who sort of liked each other rather than uh, big mates. But it, it seems that Paul and Elvis were the ones that uh, sort of got on best, as far as I can gather from uh, reading about it. I mean, they didn't fall out or anything, but they never met again. And Neil Broderick says he has a pet mouse called Elvis. Unfortunately, <laughs> he got caught in a trap. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Stephen Snoozy. <laughs> the Neverly Brothers. <laughs> the Neverly, man. <laughs> and Bill Rook says, like, Derek, like Derek's comments on Parallel Universe. Keep reading. Didn't Elvis work for Nixon? He did meet Nixon. Uh, yeah, he, he wrote to, to President Nixon. Um, and he asked the, to, to meet, and Nixon met him. And what he wanted to be uh, was enrolled as a narcotics officer believe it or not. And he did get, uh, I can't remember the government department, but the Department of Narcotics Enforcement. Um, he actually did get, become an honorary member. And he had a, a badge and he gave Nixon um, a, a, a Colt 45, replica of a, a Colt 45 as a, as a present. That's incredible. I didn't know that at all. I didn't know that at all. Because to me, uh, Nixon wanted Lennon dead, you know, because of the anti-war protests yeah. in America yeah. when he went to live in New York to go to their building. And he wanted them dead. He was a rather assassinated anyway if that other idiot, Mark Chapman, wouldn't have shot him dead. Yeah. He was a rather assassinated. That's yeah. in my opinion. Do you think so? Yeah. That's well, it. it's certainly a CIA file on Lennon, I think. Oh yeah, there's a yeah, and an FBI. Yeah, yeah. It's all coming out now. All the day that these people uh, were up to, all because of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange. Hmm. Julian Assange and uh, Edward Snowden. They 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 just revealed a lot. They just said, "Yeah, this is what they're all up to," because there are like hit lists. Hit list, and he was on them. He was on them. Lennon, yeah, John, yeah. 
Did you see it? There's a lot of people being asked in, uh, before that, uh, do you like uh, Bowie? David Bowie. Really? Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just go to a question. I'm sorry there. I'm awfully sorry. I, I didn't know yeah, that. She went to Zerich was talking before. No, oh, was it? Yeah. Let's see. What is that? Let's see. Yeah. Hey, amigos. Oh, she speaks uh, Spanish now. Yeah. yeah. Hola. Right, what did she say, Ale? Amigos? Hola, she said. Hola means hello. No, that's it. Oh, she must have spelled it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All this, uh, oh, sorry, Brian. Brian Edley says, uh, love, ba love Bowie's video for uh, Let's Dance. One of the best. Lot. That's right. I, I, I agree there. Yeah. Is that where the mm. Mitchaga? No. Oh. That was dancing in the street. Oh, dancing in the street. But yeah, yeah, let's dance. Yeah, I thought it was brilliant. But there's a couple of people on here that aren't asking to set a clip. Did you see that thing? I seen a little thing in one of the papers over the weekend. And it, someone had found these tapes. And they were Bowie tapes. And he was singing songs in the studio that other yeah. people had read. Did you yeah. see it? I, I didn't see that, but I mean, he, he's an interesting guy, Bowie. I mean, he was very nearly a one hit wonder. He's one of those people that started out in about 1963 or so with a, a band called the Conrad. I think he was. He played the sax when he started, before he started singing and stuff. And he was in a bunch of bands right across the 1960s. Um, and then I think it was about 69 with uh, Space Oddity he had his first hit. But it was another two years or so uh, before Starman became a hit. And, you know, that was really, I think, when glam rock arrived at that sort of time, 71, 72 ish. Um, and it really suited Bowie down to the to the ground. You know, he finally had a vehicle that he could uh, very effectively ride with. I mean, I think that early that Ziggy Stardust era was uh, was awesome. Yeah, oh, that was really good. I seen him after he made um, um, Space Oddity. He, he yeah. went. He dropped out for a while, didn't he? He, he never made up. And, and then he was on the, there was a, a, a thing in Liverpool called the Top Rank. It was a nightclub. Yeah. And he was on there and we went and it, there was not that many people. <coughs> I only went because of Space Oddity. But there was yeah. not that many people there. And then the next thing, Ziggy Stardust. You couldn't get a ticket for anywhere then. No, exactly. I mean, that was what when his career really took off. Yeah, you know, after if it, you know, it's possible to argue again. You know, parallel universes is if glam rock didn't come around, uh, Bowie might well have stayed just as a one-hit wonder because he kept branching off. Um, I, I think it was just after, just before that, he was in a band called Feathers, and he was very much experimenting with mime and um, all kinds of uh, stuff. I mean, he tried just about. Uh, everything. I mean, in one way, you could say, you know, it's unbelievably versatile because he was mm -hmm. into all kinds of um, avenues. And then he kept reinventing himself, which I thought was um, was interesting. You know, the thin white duke, uh, a lad insane. I thought that was quite clever. A lad insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, you know, he, he was one of these fellas, one of these artists who you couldn't really identify the real Bowie. Yeah, if you get the meaning, you couldn't identify. Absolutely, I mean, I sometimes wonder if because he spent like literally the entire nineteen sixties trying to break into uh, the rock and roll world, as it were, that when he did crack it and he cracked it with um, a persona, you know, Ziggy Stardust, um, and then when that ran its course, he he invented a lad insane, and then the thin white duke, and I I sometimes wonder uh, whether or not you know. It, I wouldn't say he was hiding behind the persona, uh, but but he was projecting, you know, a bit like Machiavelli and the Prince, you know, the mask and all the rest of it, um, behind the mask. And I, I sometimes wonder whether um, that was that was very much what Bowie was trying to achieve. He, he was actually taking on a persona uh, for each of these particular uh, parts of his um, career. Yeah, it, it was like... Um... As you said, Ziggy Stardust, and I, I, I watched a film he was in, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Yeah. And I think, I think it, I think it was the identification or symbolised what 
Bowie was all about. Yeah. You know, you were saying he, he was reinventing himself all the time. Yeah. And I think he was yeah. sort of reinventing himself in the man who felt so weird because he left yeah. the script and I like this. And yeah. it, it was him. And then he did that, you know, a very unorthodox film, mm. which was very graphic. And yeah. it was goodbye, you know, Mr. Chris, what was it? Mr. Chris. Oh, yeah, the Japanese Prisoner of War one. Yeah, I thought that um, was absolutely it, amazing. Yeah, I can't remember. It yeah, he was a good actor. Something about Christmas, wasn't it? That's, that's right. The Christmas or something like something that. like that. Yeah, I can't remember the exact title, but yeah, yeah, he made quite a few movies across the. Yeah, uh, he did, across and, the and he was a good actor. Yeah, but that that, that one about uh, the man who felt so weird. I think, yeah. uh, I, I think it, there was more to it about him. Mm. than the film itself yeah, yeah. you know it, it, i think it he was like dying he, he was a dying alien wasn't he yeah. he was a dying alien and he needed to get away from mm. it mm. and i think that it could have been his music at the time absolutely yeah and yeah, then absolutely. you know he he, he he came back and you know I'm not saying he was like uh, old blue eyes making comebacks after comebacks. <laughs> he was just reinventing himself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, he just took on a completely different persona every couple of years. And yeah, then, you exactly. know, that was really projected. And he's just one of these iconic figures of yeah. the music world. Great artist. No, oh, absolutely. You mentioned Johnny Cash. I think everybody liked Johnny Cash. Everybody. I like Johnny absolutely. Cash. You absolutely. know, so... No matter what kinds of genre music you liked, yeah, you liked Johnny Cash, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. Oh, Anything, yeah. And um, it's just like Bowie. I think Bowie was the same. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. All right, then. Charlie Kern says Elvis films rubbish, and Neil Broderick says I agree. And Bill Luke says, when I have done radio shows on the Cosmos, I get them to play Starman by David Bowie. Yeah. And Keith Leedy, I don't know if you've seen this, Bowie's final video, Black Star, yeah. shows characters gyrating like Elvis on the cross. Very weird video. Yeah. Yeah, he had some very I, strange imagery across the, uh, across the times. He was there in two hours, wasn't he? He was Andy Warhol's mate at one time, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was. I wonder if he liked Yoko's that way. <laughs> when I have done radio shows, oh, that's brilliant. You've yeah. said that, haven't you? Yeah. And I've said the next one. Yeah. Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. That uh, was the one. Yeah. That was yeah. the one. Yeah. Thank you, Keith Reddy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Do you want to read? Uh, I can't. I'm going to put the kettle on. Stephen Stay, talking about football. Say maximum is missing on uh, Wednesday. No, leave it. Okay. Leave it, leave it. Mark Kinnish, you mentioned the Beach Boys before. I found out Brian Wilson was very jealous of the Beatles. He has a breakdown, apparently, due to how big the Beatles got. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, I did. I knew that. Yeah, yeah I, I know he had a breakdown. Like the Beatles. Yeah, Sorry, but, the Beatles actually, Paul Mark, but McCartney particularly, uh, credited um, uh, the Beach Boys' Pet Sounds as being one of the great influences for Pepper. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, the thing is, you see, I, I know that they didn't like the Beatles because, mm. albeit that they, the Beatles were before them and whatever, and they were still such a phenomenon, yeah. the Beatles. And they came on the scene, albeit that they were phenomenal themselves. Uh, uh, but the, the Beatles were always head and shoulders above them, and they didn't yeah. like No one liked us in America. Do you know where I know to add, and we've, we've had this discussion before, but would you say the Beach Boys were one of the best bands to come out of the States? Um, I, I think in the sort of lighter music uh, the, uh, genre, yeah, I, I mean they're very good. I mean a lot of a lot of their stuff's uh, quite classic. I mean the harmonies are great. They did covers a doo wop song, so that's no, no bad thing. Uh, but I mean there, there are some pretty awesome bands as well. I mean people like Frank Zappa don't get anything like. Wow, the, really, yeah. 
There's that. And then you've got the uh, psychedelic era, people like uh, Jefferson Airplane, Doors. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I was never a big Doors fan at the time. I saw them at the Isle of Wight. I mean, they were very good. Uh, do, you I, who I liked? do you know who I liked? Candy. Yeah. Who, sorry? Candy. Oh, right. I liked them. Yeah. I thought they were great. Yeah. Oh, they're fabulous they band. Were. Yeah. Oh, I, fabulous I just, band. Derek, will you come on again? Because we, 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 we've just gone past nine o'clock, unfortunately. We've got to right. throw this clip on. Will you come on again? Yeah, I'd love to, mate. I enjoy chatting. Because uh, I'll tell you for why. I gave an interview to two people once, and you'd be made up with them. Mike Pender. Oh, right. Interviewed him on the show. Yeah. And not only came and they never forget the Mersey Beat era. Yeah. They never forget it. And this is, you know, when I was chatting to them on two different occasions, by the way, uh, they couldn't get over it. And I also, do you ever remember Aisha Brooke? She used no, to be a UFO. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Do you yeah, remember the UFO. And uh, she did, Aisha just and she wanted to go to the she all, all she ever wanted to go to was the cavern and jason i'll tell right. you this and she said yeah. would you bring me to the cavern if i come to liverpool wow I says yeah by all means I go down to st nick's and i'll marry her as well <laughs> she never claimed perfect she stood up at the old <laughs> stood up at the old no she only wanted to go to the cavern and I'll exactly. close on that. So will you come on in a couple of weeks, Eric, please? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I look forward to it, mate. But it'll be there like the same time on a Friday, if, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, it's perfect time, this. Excellent stuff. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Derek. I'll, uh, me and our will see you soon, eh? Nice yeah, to meet you. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Great to see you guys again. Good Cheers. night. Good night.